Welcome everyone. This is Thursday night in the Word and you know we're really happy to be here tonight and we thank God for the opportunity to share His Word. You know this is what the early church lived on. The early church the Bible says they went from house to house and the temple breaking bread and having fellowship around the apostles doctrine. And don't you long for that day again when a lot of the extra things in life we're not caught up in, but we're, we're thrilled that we can sit around and talk about the Word of God and share and uh, about the experiences of the Lord. Uh, and that's what we want to do tonight. We want to talk a little bit about, you know, God's Word. And like uh, we've talked about before, we've been doing and looking into what we call the foundations of Christ. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead work, works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, which we're on right now, laying on of hands, uh, then resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. He said these things we will do if God permits. And, and the reason why we do them again is because of the fact of what Hebrews 5.12 says when he speaks about um, how that when we ought to be teachers, uh, we have need again to be taught the very elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ because strong meat belongs to those who are mature. And God wants us to have a good solid foundation to, lay on, to stand on so that when we face times, we are able to discern both good and evil, and we're able to walk upright before the Lord. And so that's why we do this. That's why we're interested in, in teaching God's Word and having what we call discipleship, because it's too important that God's people be equipped. The Bible teaches us that we err because we don't know the Scriptures. In other words, we don't have a foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, what can you build on? Too many people in the church do not have a solid foundation to stand on. And when the storms of life come, when the weeds grow up, uh, when, the, when the land gets dry, um, then what they do have is choked out and they have trouble standing. But when you have a firm foundation on Jesus Christ the rock, you can stand the tests of time. You can stand against the wiles of the devil. You can stand against principalities and powers. Because you submit yourself to God and you resist the devil and the Bible says he will flee from you. And so this word of God is important. And, and we've been talking about the doctrine of baptisms and we've covered um, baptism in water, the importance of it, that it's not just a church tradition. It's not just some ordinance that we do. It has a significance in our life. It's about our um, salvation process. We've also talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that took place in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost um, when the disciples received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. We talked about how that's how it was carried out throughout as they went and ministered, people receiving Jesus Christ, being baptized in Jesus' name, and then sometimes some of the apostles would come down and they would pray for them, speak to them, lay hands on them, and they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with that initial evidence. Uh, we've talked about um, uh, how important that is today. It's not something from the past. It's not something that's no longer for us. You can't back that up in the Scripture. We talked about how there's a difference in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues and the operation of the gifts. Um, we talked about how that um, it's important for us today and that we even looked at have tongues ceased and why it's important for a believer to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with that initial evidence of speaking in tongues because Paul said he would that all of you would speak in tongues. And he says, I sing and pray in the Spirit more than all of you. And we, we emphasized how that the importance of that is the Scripture says that it builds us up in the most holy faith. It strengthens us. It, it helps us to stand strong. But now we want to talk about um, the baptism, another aspect of, aspect of the doctrine of baptism, and that is the baptism of fire. A lot of, um, a lot of people who teach and preach the gospel 
um, consider what the baptism of, fi of the fire is a bad thing or a negative thing. But yet, uh, I want us to take a look at the baptism of fire from another viewpoint. Um, I want us to look at this baptism of fire in a different way. And we want to we want to try to glean from the scriptures. Even though this baptism and the cup that we're talking about here, this cup of affliction, has been rejected by multitudes of self-seeking Christians for centuries, we want to talk about it tonight and understand as we start talking about it how important that it is in our lives. Um, because we know, don't we, if we are honest with ourselves, and we're not self-righteous, or we're not puffed up, or we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, we understand, we understand that this journey of ours is not over, and that we have not arrived. That we're still pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. And that's what sin is. Sin is missing the mark. We miss the mark sometimes. Uh, we understand from Scripture that um, there's times when we walk in the flesh. Paul said to the Corinthians, Brethren, I would like to speak to you about spiritual things, but I can't because you are yet carnal. What made them carnal? What made them walking it, to be walking in the flesh? What made them come to a place that Jesus was in them, but they were not walking in him. He said, he said you're, you're carnal because there's strife and envy and jealousy and discord among you. Um, you are breaking relationships. You think more highly of this person than you do this person. You're a respecter of persons. Um, a little later on, he talks about how that there was sin in their camp there that was uh, so grotesque that not even the Gentiles would accept it, and that is that a man would have his father's wife. And, and Paul talks to them about the importance of church discipline, not allowing that to take place, and we'll get into that a little bit more later on, but we can see that we, are not, we have not arrived yet, and so we're still pressing on. We're on a journey of transformation uh, in which that is a life of sanct being sanctified, set apart for the master's use, but also getting out of our lives everything that's not like God. And, and how that happens a lot of times is God's work in us through and by the baptism of fire. Um, Luke 3, 16, 17, and also Matthew 3, 10 through 12 talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire in those same verses. In Luke chapter 3, 16, 17, it says, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Same thing is repeated in Matthew chapter 3, 10 through 12. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with uh, uh, water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoot sandals I am not worthy to carry. I will, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There is, there is a lot of disputing among scholars as to whether the baptism of fire is good or bad. Some think it is dealing with the judgment of sinners. I personally think it is good since Jesus is the one who is doing the baptism. James uh, 1, 16 through 17 says, Do not be deceived. My beloved brethren, for every gift, every good and perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. 
Everything that comes from God, even though at the moment it might not seem good, is good for us. Discipline is good for us. Jesus taking us to the woodshed. Jesus doing that so that we can bear more fruit is healthy for us. And so um, we can see that people may feel it's bad, but yet um, God wants us to know that it is for our good. Uh, this separation that we're talking about, this separation of wheat and tares, this separation of, of things in our lives that we need to get rid of, um, is both seen in the corporate church as well as in individual lives as far as believers. We, we know that there's going to be a corporate separation. God is weeding out the unbelievers from the believers. We, we need to realize that we're in a time right now where that process is beginning to take place. I want you to know as persecution increases, and we're going to get it, and I, I know that people say that, you know, you're doomsday, you're speaking doomsday stuff, and, you know, that's not what God is going to do with the church. We're going to, um, we're going to um, bring the church or the world under subjection to the things of Christ in every way, shape, or form. And, and if we just pray hard enough on some of these things, God will change his mind on what's taking place or he will change direction. But I want you to know one of these days we're going to enter into a period of time in the last days when Paul wrote, Timothy, listen to me. Listen to me, young man. In the last days, perilous times are going to come. And we're going to face those things and it's going to be in the midst of those things that God is going to call separation to come between those who are, are true believers and those that are just along for the ride or are religious. We do realize, don't we, that there is a big difference between being religious and being a Christian. And so this separation, this, this baptism of fire serves two purposes— and that is that one purpose is there's a separation in the corporate church as far as believers and unbelievers. Matthew 13, 24 um, through 30 states, uh, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you will also root the wheat up with the tares. Let both grow together together, until the harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then also 13, 47 through 50 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew the shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels but through the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 18 um, also talks about this separation. But we also know that there's a separation in the individual believer's life. God is wanting to purge out of us things that are there that are not like him, things that are offensive to God, and, and we all have them. Uh, you know, we all walk in things sometimes in the flesh, that are, and, and we walk and we may have attitudes and we may have a mindset, or we may be allowing things in our life that are an offense to God, anxiety, fear, unbelief, um, those things are all enemies of faith and, and are contrary to the things of God. Gossip, slander, backbiting, division, 
all are offensive to God. And one of the reasons why those things are so offensive is because it breaks into the heart of relationship. They are divisive things. The anxiety, fear, and unbelief breaks our relationship with God because we're not trusting him. Sowing discord and strife and, and gossip breaks the relationship between our brothers and sisters. And so we find that those things are contrary to the things of God. God hates every one of those things that breaks relationship because God is a relational God. It's about relationship with the Lord, not about just the doing. It's not about just the not doing. It's not about just being able to say I'm a Christian. God is about us having a relationship with him on a moment by moment um, basis. And so God is wanting to weed out the things in our life that are unpleasing to him. And how does he do that? He does that through the Holy Spirit working in us and bringing to the surface things that we uh, are allowing in our lives, or maybe even some things we don't even realize that they're there, he brings those to light so that we can lay them aside. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so what does that tell me? The Holy Spirit is working on me. And through sometimes the fire of the Spirit, He is bringing to the surface things as He's purifying, as He's pruning, as He's disciplining. He is bringing to the surface things that are not like God, that are unpleasing to the Lord, that I need to set aside. Whether it's mismanagement of my time, whether it's mismanagement of my finances, whether it's mismanagement of my relationship with my wife or my children or the church. It, it is God working on us that we might lay these things aside, cleansing ourselves through the fire of the Spirit that we would then walk upright before God in holiness in the fear of God, God's holiness and God's um, righteousness. He also says, a lengthy passage here, but I'm going to read it anyway. Colossians 3, um, 1 through 10 talks about how that um, if you have then been risen with Christ, then um, uh, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. God wants us to put off these things. He didn't say here, that all these things were taken care of on the day that we yielded to the things of God. We know it's a journey. We're being, we were saved. We, we believed and we were sanctified by God. At that time of us confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart, God sanctified us, set us apart for his use. But since then, we are working with God to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so we may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. We're getting rid of the stinking thinking. We're getting rid of things in our lives that are not pleasing to the Lord because our desires should be, if we've truly been born again, I want to please the Lord. I want to fulfill what God is wanting to do in my life. These things that he's talking about here, why is it so important that they are taken care of? Because they hinder us from our relationship with God. They hinder us 
from becoming mature sons and daughters of God. They hinder us from stepping into our rightful place in God's kingdom as men and women of faith and men and women who walk in the power of God's spirit. They keep us back. They break our relationship with Christ when we live in those things. And he is telling us that we need to have these things separated from our life. He wrote in 2 Timothy 19 through 22, Nevertheless, a solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some of honor and some of dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pure, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Man, he speaks to us exactly what he is wanting us to do. He tells us exactly what we need to do. We need to see these things in our life separated. That, that, that we would look to God and hold on to God and, and, and no matter what we walk through, we know that God is able. So what does God allow then? What does God allow to take place? He allows us to go through the trying of our faith. The, the Bible says the trying of our faith worketh patience. He allows us to fall into diverse temptations. As a matter of fact, James says, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations. What in the world would be a reason to be joyful when we're going through the fiery furnace of affliction? Because it's in that fiery furnace that God reveals to us our poverty. He reveals to us things in our lives that are causing us to stumble. He, he reveals in us he, locate, he helps us to locate where we are in our experience and our walk with Christ. As he begins to reveal these things to us, we realize, wait a minute, God, I'm thankful from where you brought me from, but I still have a long way to go. I'm pressing toward the mark, but I haven't reached it yet. Help me to lay these things aside that I can continue to press on in the things that God has for me. Corporately, this separation is necessary for the welfare of the rest of the church. When, when we sit back and we allow discord and strife and sin blatantly, openly to continue, we're damaging the whole church. When, when we allow people to have attitudes and resentments and lash out against leadership and speak evil of dignitaries, or to cause strife or, or discord. We damage the whole church. And so the scripture tells us that we ought not allow it. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 7, it said, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man have his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed am absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done uh, so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do, not, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly uh, are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He says, get rid of that. Move that aside. For what? For the health of of the entire body. Now, he's not talking about getting rid of someone who fell. He's not talking about uh, getting rid of someone who's in a battle or a struggle. No, we want to walk with them. All of us have failed. All of us have fallen short. All of us are going through battles and trials and tests. He's talking about them having somebody in their midst that it's wide open, known what's going on, and they are sitting there as though there's nothing wrong. 
The person is not repentive. The person is not remorseful. The person is not wanting delivered. The person is trying to continue to do and go on in the same form or mindset, not turn from it. God is saying when that's the case, you have to, you have to do something about that. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. God has not called us to hang out with corruption or evil company. Bad company corrupts good morals. God has called us to separate ourselves. That doesn't mean that we don't try to win the loss. That doesn't mean that we're not friends with people that are not Christians. No, we want to be a light and a witness to them. But what it means is, is that they cannot be our steady diet we cannot sit around and take partake of their lifestyle or their ways. We have to separate ourselves from that. As a matter of fact, God often allows heresies and divisions to come to sort out and manifest the godly from the ungodly. Did you hear that? Sometimes God allows heresies and divisions to come so that the church can see the believer from the unbelief. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and 19 says, For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. The Bible says, Know those who labor among you. Because what you see is when somebody is doing and going in a direction that's not right, that's not the things of God, and they're moving off into a place that... Um, God would not call us to go into, then you see those in the church rise up and say, wait a minute, no, that's not right. We can't go that way. That's not the right way to think. That's not the right way to act. That's not the right way to speak. That's not the right direction to go. We need to pull back from that and make sure that we stand against that. And so these things come into the church and they're there so that um, we can recognize those among us um, who are approved. 1 John 2, 18, 19 says, Little children, um, it is the last hour. I mean, if they were in the last hour in 1 John, where are we at right now? Last seconds? As, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. He's talking about the spirit of the Antichrist, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from among us, but they were not of us. In other words, they were walking with us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Why? Because they were teaching things that were not um, what Christ taught us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. In other words, they went out from us so that they would be revealed. God reveals those that are unbelievers by allowing um, these things to come upon us, allowing these, this baptism of fire, allowing these fiery trials to come upon us so that um, people can see the difference between true believers and unbelievers. Right now, we're seeing a difference between um, those who are, are, are desiring to be mature and those who are happy and content with just where they are that one day they gave their heart to Jesus. We're seeing the difference right now. There's, a, there's being a, a, a great divide starting right now between the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. The five foolish virgins over here playing games and running and doing things and, and, and happy that you know they're, they're out here. They're not really paying much attention. They're not on alert. They're not uh, alert and, and awake. They're asleep. They're slumbering. Um, they're drunk with wine and they're out here doing things that and not looking for the bridegroom to come. And the Bible says they're caught off guard because they run out of oil. That's what we're seeing happening right now. People are not recognized the times that we're in. They don't see the signs that we're having. They don't see what's going on. They're not alert. They're not awake. And so we find them stumbling at what God is trying to do with their lives. Separation within the individual is also necessary since nothing can enter into God's kingdom that would defile it in any way. Revelations 21, 27 says, but there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17 says, do not be unequally yoked together with the unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness 
with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 17. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, that wood, hay, straw, each one's works will be made evident and clear on the day of the judgment because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's works of what sort it is. If anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God allows us to go through the tests and trials in this life, even, even the wildernesses. He, he, this baptism of fire is for a purpose and a reason. All things that God do, that he does in our lives are for a reason. He allows us to go through tests. He allows us to go through trials. Why? Because in the midst of that fire, he begins to show us the things that are in our heart. He lo helps us to locate where we are. And sometimes when we're going through the trial or the test, what we see is not pretty. Paul, um, Paul says, Oh, wretched man that I am. And Isaiah, when he saw the worship scene in the year that King Uzziah died, he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and the cher cherubims and the seraphims, they fill the temple, and they're crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And what does Isaiah? Isaiah is a prophet of God. He has a, a, a faith in God. He believes in the Lord. He is a mouthpiece to the people for God. And he says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And he says to the Lord, I dwell in the midst of a people that are unclean. And, and, and God, I, I am not worthy. And the angel takes the tongs of, off the altar. The fire of God puts them on his lips and purifies him. And then he's in the position that when he hears God say, who will go for us? Who can we send? He says, I'll go, Lord. God is wanting to burn up everything that's not like him. That's why when we talk about the discipline of God purging God purging us, pruning us, it's not a bad thing. But, but because of our attitudes and mindsets and because of the traditions of men that we've been taught, that you know Christians don't suffer, Christians don't go through those type things, Christians it's just a rose garden, we should never have no difficulties. What we find is that we have lost the art of travail and prayer. We have lost the art of um, having perseverance, persevering, when we're going through a trial or a test or we are afflicted, a lot of times we find our mouth runs off with us and we start woe is me and, and we start finding ourselves in a place to where we're going, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this to happen? What's going on? I'm telling you, God is allowing or God is causing it for your good. And it's because of the attitude sometimes we stay in that for so long. When if we would realize, man, God is doing, there's something God's doing in me, something God wants to do in me, something that's not uh, what he wants in me, I need to pay attention here and hear what the Spirit is speaking to me so that I can become what God wants me to be. So I can lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset me. This testing of our faith is important. These trials are important. The baptism of fire is revealing that that needs to be purified still in our lives because we have not arrived. We would not have to persevere if it was all over with at the day in which we believe. 
But we know that's not true. The earth is groaning. The church is groaning and moaning for the sons and the daughters, the mature ones of God to stand up. But we're never going to be mature unless we embrace a life sometimes that is a part, part of it is suffering. We have to go through these things. It's important that we go through these things for our learning, for our benefit, that we can become more like God. Israel went through what they did because God wanted to show them their heart because they were looking back. They were grumblers. They were mumblers. They were never, they were never pressing forward. God gave them everything that they needed but yet they would not believe. They were steeped in unbelief. They were steeped in fear. They went over to the promised land, saw that the land flowed with milk and honey, but oh my goodness, man, there were giants over there. And we were grasshoppers in our own sight. Did you hear me? They didn't say we were grasshoppers in their sight. They said we were grasshoppers compared to them in our own sight. And they came back and they cast that fear on the rest of the congregation and they cast that vision on the rest of the congregation. They were naysayers, even though two mighty men of God stood up and said, we're well able to take that land. We can do it right now. Let's go. They turned the hearts of the people. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until no one under the age of 20 went in or no one over the age of 20 went in. And so what is it that God's trying to do with us? He wants to show us when we're going through hard times, and we will, and we do. When we're going through difficulties, God's wanting to show us these things in our life that are hindering us from becoming everything He wants. And as He shows us through the power of the Holy Spirit, because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts, God wants us to lay those things aside, to be cleansed. To allow the purifying of the Holy Spirit, the fire, to allow the purifying of fire. The fire of God purifies. The refiner's fire purifies. And God wants to purify to himself a people who will learn to walk in the midst of trials and tribulations with their head up and their focus on Jesus and not walking around wallowing in the muck and mire and naysaying and looking back and holding on to this thing in their life. Like, you know, it's just, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my faith in Christ. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to lay that aside in the name of Jesus. God wants to raise up a, a powerful church without spot or wrinkle. I want to tell you what. All the spots and all the wrinkles and all the blemishes weren't taken out on the day that you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. The process that we're in right now is not only that He is our Savior. We thank God for that. We didn't do anything about that. We, could, we didn't have anything to do with that. He called us. He chose us. He, he was our Savior. Holy Spirit regenerated us, made us alive. We received the gift of faith, the gift of repentance, and we believed the work of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you what, to make him Lord of your life is a walk, is a journey, is a process. He doesn't want to be, he does not want to be just Savior. He wants to be Lord of all. And if we're going to be his disciples and he's going to be Lord, then we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him daily. Amen? Amen. I know God will strengthen us. He will help us and he will help you. The Holy Spirit right now is touching people's hearts. Just even as I'm speaking, you're saying, oh my goodness, I didn't think about it this way. I didn't realize that's how it was working. I need to have a different mindset as I'm going through difficulties and trials. The death of a loved one, the death of our children, the death of a spouse, the loss of a job, persecution from where we work. Those are all Difficult times. My sister right now is, is um, going through the death of her husband. Uh, those are all difficult times. But in the midst of the fire, there's someone walking with us through it. Three Hebrew children were tossed in the fire. Jesus was walking with them 
in the midst of the fire, and they were not burned, and neither did they smell like smoke when they came out. That's the kind of God that we're serving. Let's let our faith arise and our enemies be scattered. And let us focus on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No matter what you're going through right now, our God is greater. No matter what you're going through right now, our God is bigger. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come and present this tonight. And I pray that somebody's heart was touched and their life is being ministered to and that, God, you will help them to, to see why they're going through what they are and to learn a lesson from it and to lay aside the things that you bring up and God, that they would mature and grow and become what you want them to be. Father, let the Holy Spirit touch their hearts and minds right now that they can hear and see what the Spirit is saying to the church. God bless you. God bless you tonight. And we thank you so much for tuning in and being with us. Um, see you next time on Thursday Night in the Word.